All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. Today is March 10th, 2023. I am on an hour early. I was about to say late. I am on an hour early. I would like to finish the stream up and go get a little workout in. It's been a little while since I've been to the gym to work out and take care of myself. And uh, self-care is very, very important. So I am on an hour early. I typically go at noon. So some folks may still be working. And I, and I think maybe when folks tune in when I'm on at noon, maybe they're tuning in over their lunch break. So I don't know who I'll get today. But uh, the beauty of YouTube is that when you go live, you can always watch the playback of the live stream. Let me make sure I can see myself. And actually, let me turn off. There were a flurry of messages coming through from Facebook. So let me log out of that so that I don't get distracted during this one. This is one where I'm really going to have to focus. And when there are a flurry of instant messages coming through, that gets distracting. OK, so let me make sure I can see myself over here. Yep, I see the red live icon so let me click on this yep and there's me there's my mug i have a like thank you to whoever gave me that like so i'm going to play the intro i'm going to share this on my original uh channel and then i will uh jump in hopefully i can keep this concise short and sweet but it also depends on the participation I, I have from the chat. So I'll see you on the other side of the intro.
All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Big Discussions 76, Science and Technology. Well, most of you know who I am. My name is Dr. Anwar Youssef Dunbar. First of all, please like this stream. Please share it. And please subscribe, especially if you're new. I was thinking several things before starting this stream. Uh, I don't know how it is for other content creators, but sometimes things rush into your mind before you start. Uh, the first of which was, please uh, share this content. I, I believe I'm bad at looking at my analytics, but I believe most of my subscribers are melanated. I believe most of them are, are, are most of you all are, are black at this point. So you know that in this country, in the STEMs, in terms of participation, we, I haven't looked at the recent data, but we lag behind in the STEMs. So the more this information gets out, the better, the more of our people we can get interested in these things, the better. I was just thinking uh, of a, a former coworker in my current position. I remember pitching the idea to him about either collaborating on some writing or collaborating on something like this. And I don't think he was familiar with uh, content creation or the power of content creation. And his his default was, we should teach a class. We should, we should teach a college class. And I remember thinking, you know, we could do that, but there are other people who need to hear about this. So, and I think he was thinking in terms of earning an extra income, which you can do here, creating content as well. So that was just something I thought about leading up to this. Uh, T. Riddler, T. Riddler uh, says, thanks for doing this stream, Dr. Dunbar. Uh, this is something I'm very interested in. Yeah, T. Riddler, you uh, in large part inspired this one. I, I did the Lexapro video last week and, and you commented, I'm curious about drug discovery. And that's where this basically came from. So thank you. Oftentimes when you create one piece of content, it leads to the creation of other uh, pieces of content. So that's 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 how this works. Uh, Aquateki, thank you for stopping through. As always, I appreciate your support. I appreciate everyone's support here. These are science topics. These aren't the most saucy and and uh, sexy topics to everyone. So it's a select group who comes over here to hang out. Um, regularly. So I appreciate that. Aquateki says greetings at Big Discussion 76 Science and Technology and T. Riddler. Uh, Professor Black Professor Black Ops, he's in the, the tech sector. He says lags is putting it nicely. Yeah. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be, um, let me slow down. I'm trying to be PC. Professor Black Ops, and try not to offend anybody. That's hard to do today, but no matter what you say, you're going to offend somebody. Uh, Wayne Wallace, okay, you guys are pretty active in the chat. Wayne Wallace says, Professor Black Ops, salute. Okay, so guys, we're going to talk a little bit about drugs today and where drugs come from. The process is actually called uh, drug discovery drug discovery. And it's a big business. Uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals, it's a very, very big business. And I'm going to start us off with this slide here, which is a slide that um, I presented when um, I first took a look at the, the climate debate, because this gets to what's at the heart of the climate debate. This video is not about climate. I, I, I did a, uh, a 30,000 foot look about a month ago at 
what's in that, what, what causes that debate and what the, the, the issues are in that debate. And this question was actually posed to me by someone a while ago. Do you believe in science? So do you believe in science? Science is um, asking why. Science is uh, considering alternative hypotheses. Science involves a, a flexibility of mind. Science involves generating hard data. Science involves not believing things blindly. Science involves uh, the peer review of data. So having your peers look at your data and question your data and its validity and what the and observing what the holes are and making recommendations. And then finally, science is thinking critically and questioning things. Okay, so the reason I, I thought that it would be appropriate to show that slide for this particular stream is that all of that goes into drug discovery. There are a lot of questions that get asked and there are a lot of questions that have to get answered from the lab bench to the CEO's office and, and, and the quality assurance office of the company to the government regulators. There are a whole lot of questions that have to be asked and answered before a drug goes out to the public. Let me read this comment here. Uh, Toya the Tutor, I'm sorry, is it Toya the Tutor or, or Toya Sud? I can't keep up with your, your, uh, your alias is Toya. Okay. So what is science? And, 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 and so how, do, how does all of that relate to drug discovery? Okay. Well, I'm going to start off broad and I'm going to get steadily more focused. Okay. So what is drug discovery? What is drug discovery? Well, it turns out that years ago, when I, Tori is laughing, it turns out that years ago, probably between 2016, when I started my first blog, and 2018, right before the, the world event, I wrote a series of blog posts for, for the general public, for general knowledge, to distill out what pharmacology and toxicology and drug metabolism and inhalation toxicology to, to distill out what those are because what would happen was I would meet other professionals here in uh, the DMV and I would go to career fairs in the DMV, many over in Prince George's County. And number one, I would be told that I was the first black scientist any of those individuals had met, number one. And number two, there was always a mix up between what pharmacology is and what pharmacy is. And they're, they're different, they're not the same thing. So the, there was a general lack of knowledge on what pharma, pharmacology and pharmacy and toxicology are, and then forget about drug metabolism and inhalation toxicology. Uh, so I wanted to start to simplify these these areas for people. So I wrote this blog post. It's in the description box below. And I called it a look at STEM. What is pharmacology? Okay, I want to acknowledge Dr. Paul Hollenberg. He was the, the department chair at the University of Michigan's Department of Pharmacology. When I was a student, he was gracious enough to take a look at this before I published it. I think I acknowledged him here. It's very, very comprehensive. It's very, very, I wrote this to be very, very understandable by the laypersons and the non-science people and the non-science citizens in our in our country. By the way, uh, everyone, I don't, I don't have a super chat or AdSense over here. If it is laid upon your heart to make a donation to the channel, that information is there. 
So this link is in the description box below. You can read it for yourself. I'm going to fast forward and focus on the part that T. Riddler is interested in. Pharmacology is a broad field, and there are many, many sub-disciplines within the one field. There's ADME drug metabolism, ADME slash drug metabolism, antimicrobial pharmacology, autonomic pharmacology, cancer pharmacology, cardiovascular pharmacology, endocrine and receptor pharmacology, drug discovery, neuropharmacology, and pharmacogenomics. Okay, so we're just going to focus on drug discovery today. And I want to acknowledge that if any other pharmacologists watch this, I want to acknowledge this and, and, and put this disclaimer out there. There are whole lectures on drug discovery and target identification. So this is just going to be a a simplified explanation for what that is, because we could talk for hours and hours about this. And there are all chapters and textbooks on this. So this is just a simplified discussion in case any of my peers come in here and say, hey, he didn't say this. He didn't say that. Hey, you, you forgot this. You forgot that. Scientists are like that. Anyway, drug discovery. What is drug discovery? Drug discovery is typically uh, associated with the private sector and deals with the identification of new drug entities and the identification of new drug targets. In industry, pharmacologists generally refer to drugs as either small molecules, which are our classic drugs like aspirin. Those are roughly, that, that has a molecular weight of roughly 180 grams per mole or large molecules, which are as heavy as 150,000 grams per mole. These are also known as biologics, which are generally proteins which, ha which have heavy, I'm sorry, these are generally proteins which have therapeutic effects when given to patients. An example is AbbVie's Humira. The units, uh, grams per mole, designate a chemical's uh, molecular weight, and as you can see, the size differ. The difference between the two classes is considerable. It's been a while since I read this. So, what does that mean? Okay. Well, let me show some drugs here for those of you who are uh, who want to know what. Um, these are examples of drug active ingredients. So, when you get the the, the pill, the pill has uh, multiple molecules in it, but the active ingredient is the actual entity that's causing the biological and therapeutic effect. Okay, so these are examples of drug active ingredients. So there's aviptadil, look at the size of that molecule. There's ibuprofen, remdesivir, that one was in the news during the, the world health crisis. These two were also in the news during the uh, world health crisis, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. And there's also vitamin C and there's also albuterol. Does anyone in the chat have asthma? Does anyone in the chat have asthma or know someone who has had asthma? Yes, no, maybe. Aquateki says you left a one. So that means you either you either have asthma or you know someone who does. Yeah, everybody knows someone who uh, who's had asthma. Engineering cannabis, thank you for uh, stopping through. He says. Good day. Have you seen the article of an AI discovering a cancer cell four years before it was fully formed? 
an early cancer detector. CNN had the article. No, I have not seen that, but I will take a look. Okay, so I asked that question about asthma because albuterol, if you use the inhaler, albuterol is the classic drug for asthma patients. That's given as a, a, a aerosol to the respiratory passage. All right. So those were drug active ingredients. So I'm going to show you a quick slide here for the sizes of drugs. And as you might have expected, it's the one slide that did not load up. Hold on. Because I want to give you guys a feel for the sizes. The sizes are important. And when you listen to pharmacologists talk or you listen to individuals who work at pharmaceutical companies talk, you'll hear the term small molecule, large molecule come up. This is a, uh, uh, an important part of the vocabulary. So a small molecule, in this instance, <clears throat> the size is less than 900 Daltons or 900 grams per mole. Those are units for size and molecular weight. Ibuprofen has a molecular weight of 206.3 grams per mole. A large molecule ranges from uh, 3,000 to 150,000 Daltons or 3,000 uh, to 150,000 uh, grams per mole. So that's a much bigger molecule. So I mentioned uh, Humira uh, in my blog post. That is a, uh, that is a, um, it's an antibody. It's an antibody. Uh, uh, geez, what, what's, I'm losing the uh, the terminology for. It. But you see, how, you see how big it is. It's it's an antibody chain, uh, and and it's 144 grams per mole. So it's right at the top. And typically, your um, your large molecules typically have to be injected into the bloodstream of the patient because they're too big to be absorbed by the uh, gastrointestinal tract. Okay, so that's drug discovery. And I can't, for the love of me, I, I can't, Think of the term, the the epitope, where where the 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 uh, the antibody it, it recognizes the antigen. The antibody versus the antigen. Okay, well, an antibody uh, it, there, there's a chain, and 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 the drug they're injecting those 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 chains those those recognition uh, domains into the patient, and that aids in the treating the inflammation. Science, you got to look everything up every now and then because there's so much information that you you forget. So drug discovery. So you, when I was going through my education, there were uh, two main drug companies that I think we all had our eyes on. And it was these two. Pfizer and Merck, these were the leaders in big pharma. These are global companies, but there are also small pharma companies and there are also smaller startup biotech companies. And <clears throat> all of these companies have a drug pipeline, which is basically, it's, it's the, the pathway through which the drugs are developed. And they can either develop the drugs in-house 
but I think things got to a point where f part of Pfizer's model was just simply acquiring the smaller companies and acquiring the intellectual property for their drug targets that way. I think I think for the most part, Merck was developing all their drugs in-house, but I know that Pfizer was um, gobbling up smaller companies. Okay, so we're gonna jump in here. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep us going. A lot of basic research, as, as I read some of this to you guys, I want you to keep in mind that a lot of basic research goes into the development of these drugs and the identification of the targets. So if you go back to my slide, do you uh, believe in science? A part of that is generating hard data. It's doing experiments. It's, it's publishing. It's, it's testing uh, um, hypotheses. It's, it's testing a hypothesis and looking at that target from multiple areas. And, and this work, it, it all takes place uh, in a research lab that could be at any academic university or that could be at a pharmaceutical company. So there's a lot of research that goes into this. And I just wanted to communicate that before I, I jump into what I'm going to share with towards the end of this. If you want to read some more about what basic research is, because that's a key term on the biological sciences side, basic research. If you want to read more about what basic research is, it just so happens that I wrote a piece on it. I don't think this one is below in the description box yet, but it gets to that world, the world of doing experiments, the world of writing papers, the world of publishing articles, the world of uh, making the discoveries at the bench. So there's a lot of that work that goes into finding and optimizing and then taking those drug targets onto uh, the clinic. So if you want to read some more about that, the link is here and I'll leave it in the description box once this stream is done. basic research. And if you've ever watched Nicole's, Nicole Ali's content, I haven't heard much from Nicole lately. I need to reach out to her and see how she's doing. If you if you ever watched her content, Nicole does a lot of uh, research uh, at the bench. She's generating data. She's doing the statistics. She's applying for the grants and she's writing papers. So when you think about Nicole, think about think about this aspect. Okay, drug targets. I've showed you guys what drug active ingredients are. We've talked about uh, molecular weights and drug sizes. Let's talk about target identification. So, what is a okay? What does a drug do? What a drug does. Let's go back to last week. Last week. I uploaded a pre-record on the drug Lexapro. And thank you to all of you who watched that. This is the structure for Lexapro. And I have too many files in here. <laughs> Hold on. Let me get rid of uh, biofuels. I don't need it right now. Okay. This is the structure for Lexapro. So that that's another part of pharmacology and drug discovery uh, and drug targets. And that's, and that's that every mo every drug has a unique structure. So this is the structure for Lexapro. There's a lot of chemistry, a lot, there's a lot of organic chemistry involved in this. So what you also need to keep in mind is that
the researchers, in order to create Lexapro, the researchers uh, had to understand how um, they had to understand regions of the brain. They had to understand how the brain works. They had to understand that there are neurons in the brain. Uh, and they had to understand that the neurons in the brain um, function through uh, the secretion and activation uh, by different neurotransmitters. Uh, one of those neurotransmitters uh, is uh, serotonin. Let me get rid of uh, my ecology slide here. This is serotonin. This is a neurotransmitter in the, that's uh, secreted in the raffi nuclei in the brain. Uh, and it's involved with mood, okay? And the way that Lexapro works is it blocks the reuptake of that serotonin. So when those neurons in that region of the brain are activated, serotonin uh, is, um, it diffuses down to those receptors there on the post synaptic terminal. And then after a certain amount of time, it comes off and it goes up through that channel there, uh, designated by that 5-HT. Well, what the drug does is it blocks that serotonin from going back up into that that presynaptic terminal so it hangs out more and it hangs out longer in the synapse i'll show that to you one more time and the reason i'm showing this to you guys is is to communicate that they first had to understand how this mechanism worked so there's understanding the physiology there's understanding how the body works down to the at the molecular level and then you do your pharmacological research around what you know about the body itself. Okay, so that's how that, that that's an example of how drugs are discovered. So let me go to this piece that uh, I found here. Engineering cannabis says pharmacology is continuing to evolve. I've seen the field of computational pharmacology becoming big. Yep, I'm going to get to that engineering cannabis. So this is a piece I found from um, Millipore Sigma. If you're in the, the research world, particularly in the biomedical sciences, particularly in pharmacology and toxicology, you are familiar with Millipore and Sigma. This is entitled Target identification and validation for early drug discovery. So again, we're searching for targets here. Early stages of drug discovery start with uh, initial steps of target identification and moves to the latter, the later stages of lead optimization. Multiple sources, including academic research, Clinical works and uh, commercial and the commercial sector help in the identification of a suitable disease target. The chosen uh, target is then used by the pharmaceutical industry and more recently by some academic centers to identify <clears throat> molecules for making acceptable drugs. The process involves various early steps. So you can see that cartoon there, or it's a flow chart. So steps include uh, target identification, target validation, hit generation, uh, lead development. Uh, and then if you look at the bottom there, there's early discovery, uh, preclinical studies, clinical phase one, clinical phase two, clinical phase three, and then manufacturing. So there are a whole slew of steps that go into the 
the production of this drug from the time that the target is identified to when it actually ends up in CVS or Rite Aid. Uh, I'm going to read this next section. And I think since engineering cannabis is here, I think there's a part of his expertise that's going to lend itself well to this discussion. So target identification and validation. So target identification and characterization begins with identifying the function of a possible therapeutic target, uh, parentheses, uh, a gene slash a protein, and its role uh, in the disease. Identification of the target is followed by a characterization of the, of the molecular mechanisms addressed by the target. A good target should be efficacious, should be safe, uh, it should meet clinical, and commercial requirements and be druggable. Okay, so approaches. Data mining using bioinformatics. So that is identifying uh, and selecting and prioritizing potential disease targets. So I think this is where engineering cannabis <laughs> and machine learning come in because I just told you guys about basic research. So in every at every major research institution, like the University of Michigan, okay, there are experiments being done, there are papers being written, there are profuse amounts of papers being written, there's so much data being generated. When you think about bioinformatics, I think now we're talking about using machine learning to sift through all of that data, all of the receptor binding experiments, all of the kinetics experiments, all of the binding experiments, all of the animal experiments, I think machine learning is now being used to sift through all of that and to come up with targets more easily and more quickly than in the past. Engineering Cannabis, if you're still out there, let me know if that's a, an adequate assessment or not. But I, but I think that's where bioinformatics, I don't have a background in bioinformatics, but I think that's what that field entails. Because there's so much data and there's so much research out there, there, there needs to be a way to get through to the answers that you need. And I think that's what bioinformatics does. So, there's, so that's a, an, an application for machine learning in this particular field. Okay, genetic association. Uh, genetic polymorphisms and connections with uh, the disease, uh, the expression profile, uh, changes in uh, mRNA slash proteins, uh, pathways and phenotypic analyses, uh, in vitro cell-based mechanistic studies, and then functional screening, <clears throat> knockdown, knockout, or using target-specific tools. So what they're talking about there, they're getting status steadily more complex you're going from identifying the targets to using molecular approaches so you're testing the drug at dna and rna levels and you're going to cells cell-based assays and then you're going into whole animals so that's showing the progression and the um the, the progression and complexity of your testing mechanisms for the target. I'm not gonna read through all of these, uh, but these are tools for uh, identification and validation. These are examples of uh, tools for target identification and validation. Disease association, genetics and expression changes, bioactive molecules, cell-based models, protein interactions, uh, analysis of signal signaling pathways, uh, functional analysis, uh, overexpression, transgenics, antisense, RNA, and gene variants. This is the ending of it. Target validation. Target validation shows that a, mo a molecular target is directly involved in disease, in a disease process. <clears throat> and that modulation of the target is likely to have 
a therapeutic effect, the most important criteria for target validation is to take multi-validation uh, approaches. So approaches include genetic manipulation of uh, the target genes in vitro, knocking down the genes, knocking out the genes. So here you see CRISPR. Me and Nicole have talked about CRISPR. So gene editing approaches. Uh, using antibodies. Uh, using antibodies to interact uh, with the target with high affinity and blocking further interactions uh, and chemical genomics. Okay, so they go into this spiel here about how they can help with that. And these are products supporting target identification, characterization, and validation. But you see CRISPR is there. So a lot of labs are using uh, CRISPR right now. I'm not going to read over all of this. This is in the description box below. So what I want to communicate to you all or to whoever's watching this is that there is a very identifying a drug target today can be a very, very coordinated thing. It can be a very, very uh, orchestrated and coordinated uh, thing, all right? So that's one approach. You're using all the tools that you have available to you to whittle down this one target, uh, and then you have to validate the target using multiple steps and approaches to get it through to um, the general public. But some drugs are also found by uh, accident, and I'm going to get to that now. Engineering Cannabis says the application of machine learning and deep learning to discover drugs and also uh, effects on human cells are now a focus with big drug companies. That's right. That's right. That will save a lot of time and energy identifying uh, targets and molecules that will work. So there's the coordinated approach where you're methodically looking for targets and molecules that will work on those targets. And then sometimes you find targets by accident. And actually, I'll, I will credit my father with calling this one to my attention last week when I saw him. So there's, well, male contraceptives. We, for most of our lifetimes, we've heard a lot about female contraceptives. Well, there's a lot of talk these days about male contraceptives and they may have found one by accident. This is entitled, this is from Newsroom. This is entitled uh, On Demand Male Contraceptive Shows Promise in a Preclinical Study. This was published on February 14th. I'm not going to play this video. I don't want a copyright strike, but that is showing basically uh, a healthy sperm in the control and then uh, a sperm that has been inactivated by this potential new drug, which is a, uh, a soluble adenylocyclase inhibitor. If I got that wrong, we'll get the right a name for that shortly. Okay, this reads as follows. This is a short one, I promise. Let me blow it up for myself. All right. An experimental contraceptive drug candidate developed by uh, Wheel Cornell Medicine investigators temporarily stops sperm in their tracks and prevents pregnancies in preclinical models. The study published in Nature Communications on February 14th demonstrates that an on-demand male contraceptive is possible. The discovery would be a game changer for contraception, according to the study's co-senior authors, 
Dr. Joshin Buck, and Dr. Lonnie Levin, or Levin, Levin or Levine, who are professors of pharmacology at Wheel Cornell Medicine. Doctors Buck and Levine noted <clears throat> that condoms which have existed for about 2,000 years and vasectomies have been men's only options to date. Research on male oral contraceptives has stalled, partly because potential contraceptives for men must clear <clears throat> a much higher bar for safety and side effects. Dr. Levine said, because men don't bear the risks associated with carrying pregnancy, carrying a pregnancy, he explained, the field assumes men will have a low tolerance for potential contraceptive side effects. Doctors Buck and Levine did not initially set out to find a male contraceptive. They were friends and colleagues with complementary skill sets. But uh, when Dr. Levine challenged Dr. Buck to isolate an important cellular signaling protein called soluble adenylocyclase, that had long um, eluded biochemists, Dr. Buck couldn't resist. It took him two years. Doctors Buck and Levine then shifted the research focus to studying soluble adenylate cyclase and eventually merged their laboratories. The team discovered that mice genetically engineered to lack soluble adenylate cyclase are infertile. So they knocked out the gene. Then in 2018, Dr. Melanie Ballback, a postdoctoral associate in their lab, made an exciting discovery while working on soluble adenylate cyclase inhibitors as a possible treatment for an eye condition. She found that mice that were given a drug that inactivates soluble adenylate cyclase produce sperm that cannot propel themselves forward. The team was reassured that the SAC inhibitor might be a safe contraceptive option by another team's report that men who lacked the gene encoding SAC were infertile but otherwise healthy. So they found it by accident. They were researching something else and they found this by accident. The new, the new nature communications study demonstrates that a single dose of the SAC inhibitor called TDI-1186 immobilizes mice sperm for up to two hours, uh, up to two and a half hours, and that the effects persist in the female reproductive tract after mating. After three hours, some sperm begin regaining motility. By 24 hours, nearly all sperm have recovered normal movement. TDI-11861 treated male mice paired with female mice exhibited normal uh, mating behavior, but did not impregnate females despite 52 different mating attempts. Male mice treated with uh, an inactive control substance, by contrast, impregnated almost one third of their mates. Our inhibitor works within 30 minutes to an hour, Dr. Balbeck said, every other experimental hormonal or non-hormonal male contraceptive takes weeks to bring sperm count down, sperm counts down or render them unable to fertilize eggs. Additionally, Dr. Balbeck noted that it takes weeks to reverse the effects of other hormonal and non-hormonal male contraceptives in development. She said that since the SAC inhibitors wear off within hours and men would take it only when and as often as needed, they could allow men to make day-to-day -day decisions about their fertility. Doctors Ballback and Levine noted that it took substantial medicinal chemistry work to develop TDI-11861, and this was accomplished in partnership with the Tri-Institutional Therapeutics Discovery Institute. The TDI works with investigators from Will Cornell Medicine, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and the Rockefeller University to expedite early stage drug discovery. This highly productive collaboration between TDI and uh, the Buck Levin Lab 
clearly illustrates the power of partnering pharma-trained drug discovery scientists with academic innovators, said Dr. Peter Mikey, Sanders Director of the TDI. The Buck Levine Lab's collaboration with TDI was fostered and nurtured by Will Cornell Medicine Enterprise uh, Innovation, the office that accelerates the translation and commercialization of technologies arising from research conducted by Will Cornell faculty and trainees. In addition, Enterprise Innovation is leading the out licensing of this discovery to their startup company. The team is already working. The team is already working on making SAC inhibitors better suited for using in humans. Dr. Levine said, Drs. Buck and Levine launched uh, SACL Pharmaceuticals with colleague Dr. Gregory Kopp, who serves as the company's chief scientific officer. The next step for the team is repeating their experiments in a different preclinical model. These experiments will lay the groundwork for human clinical trials that would test the effect of SAC inhibition on sperm motility in healthy human males, Dr. Buck said. If the drug development and clinical trials are successful, Dr. Levine said he hopes to walk into a pharmacy one day and hear a man request the male pill. All right. So the take home from that, in addition to the fact that we have a male oral contraceptive pill on the way, is that they identified this target and the effect by accident. They were looking for something else and they stumbled upon a gold mine. Aquateki says, uh, yeah, amazing to hear what scientists discover by accident. I'm going to give two more examples here. I'm not going to read these because we're coming up on an hour. But another important drug in modern society that was discovered by accident was... Viagra, also known as uh, sildenafil citrate, as I described in my Lexapro video. Drugs have uh, two names. They have uh, a generic name and an industry name, I think it is. But Viagra was discovered by accident. They were working on They were looking for um, a drug to treat angina, I believe. And if I recall correctly, well, since I'm here on the internet, let me make sure this is accurate. Let me fact check myself. Angina, what is angina? I believe angina is the blockage of your coronary blood vessels, so your blood vessels on your heart. And once those blood vessels on your heart get blocked, you are not far away from a heart attack. Yep. Angina is a type of chest pain caused by reduced blood flow to the heart. Yeah, so you're getting reduced blood flow. Let me show you guys the cartoon. Yeah, so let me show you guys the cartoon here. Jay Bones, thank you for stopping through. I'm coming to the end of this discussion on drug targets and drug discovery.
yeah, so angina. God help you if you get this. But what that is, is it is the uh, blockage of those arteries, of those blood vessels on your heart. Your heart, your heart is one big muscle in itself. It needs oxygen. And if your heart doesn't get it, you will suffer a heart attack. So they were looking for a drug in summary, to make this, to keep this short. They were looking for a drug to treat this. And that's how they discovered Viagra. Okay. They found it by accident. So I'm going to show one more and then I'm going to wrap this up. This piece is entitled, this is a summary of the multiple drugs that were found by accident. Uh, well, I had it here. And unfortunately, I had the same article twice. Give me a second here. Okay, and once again, that's the Viagra article. Oh, I see the problem. I see the problem. I use the same link for the same. Um... Okay, there were a number of drugs that were found this way. And as I was thinking about this stream, I also thought about uh, penicillin. So this piece is in the description box below. I'm not going to read this one. I may follow, do a follow-up on this, but it says from Viagra. Uh, this is entitled from Viagra to Valley on the drugs that were discovered by accident. So this is not a new thing. So we just talked about Viagra. Uh, penicillin is probably the classic drug that was found by accident. Okay, this led to the, the usage of our uh, antibiotics. Okay, so that was a medical breakthrough. Uh, let's see, the heart pacemaker, stomach ulcers, antidepressants, Valium. Okay. So this is a part of drug history, drugs that were discovered by accident. I'm going to return to this penicillin example really, really quickly before I wrap up. We may be, we may be facing another health crisis coming up because of this, because of resistance to antibiotics. So this is something that a lot of people are, um, well, there are a lot of things people are not paying attention to. But as far back as um, my undergraduate studies, I do recall one of my professors stating that we have to be careful with the use of antibiotics because uh, Mother Nature will adapt. And from what I'm hearing, Mother Nature has adapted so bacterial resistance to antibiotics may be the next health crisis. So keep your eyes on that. Anyhow, everyone, we are at uh, an hour. So I'm going to wrap this up. I wanted to get this one done so I could go out and go to the gym and run around. But I hope, I hope, well, T. Riddler, I hope you got something from this. I, I, I did. I have to admit that I did throw this one together pretty quickly over the last uh, two days in my mind. So if this stream came out a little bit jumbled, a little bit uh, 
incongruent, I think that's the right word, then um, that's why. And plus, <clears throat> I'm a little tired. So, but I hope someone got something from this. These are the basics of drug discovery and target identification. There's a very, very coordinated approach used by companies and research labs across the country and around the world. And then some of these are found, they're found by accident. You're looking for one thing and you find that the molecule does something else in uh, another system that uh, has benefit and that can be highly prof profitable. Jay Bones, thank you for stopping through. I think, yeah, I think, uh, Was it Penn or, or Notre Dame or was was the other uh, the other gentleman from Penn? J Bones, I think you're Notre Dame. Okay. Anyhow, she says interesting about the sperm count medicine may help some people. Well, help them with what? I think I think um, many of the Western countries sheet. I mean, this is not talking about you, but the Western countries are facing a population shortage. So this may only add to the problem. So, but it'll make money for the pharmaceutical companies. But society as a whole, that's debatable. All right, everyone, I'm going to wrap this up. If you watch this on the playback, and if you watched this live and you have any further questions, let me know in the comments section below. Uh, this may be something that I revisit. And oftentimes, after you finish streaming, you, you think of another idea and you realize, okay, geez, I, I didn't say this or I didn't say that. And then when you watch the playback yourself, you say, okay, well, I could have said that better. And I'm thinking maybe I'm already thinking of things that I could have said in more efficient ways. And, and I'm already thinking of things that I could have said more concisely. But uh, please, please consider joining my newsletter. My newsletter is here. I do a lot of writing, as you could see from um, the beginning of this stream, if you saw it. There's a two paragraph greeting there. And then you just hit that subscription button at the bottom. This form comes up, you enter in your name, and then you're a part of the group. So with that, I'm gonna wrap this up. Aquateki, thank you for the generous cash app. I appreciate your support in uh, all of these streams. I appreciate everyone who keeps coming around for this. And again, I hope someone was able to get something out of this. T Riddler, uh, especially. I know one thing I didn't show was this. Targets. I discussed uh, Lexapro and I discussed how Lexapro works and what Lexapro does. And this was talked about in the uh, the Millipor Sigma article that I read in terms of target identification. But for the most part, targets are, are proteins, they're enzymes, they're receptors, uh, they're channels. So the molecule typically interacts with a receptor or a channel or an enzyme in such a way that either uh, accentuates the activity of those molecules, of those uh, proteins. So it accentuates the activity or it blocks the activity. That's typically how a drug works. And the same thing is true when the drug interacts with a uh, nucleic acid. It usually binds it, it usually inhibits the, the downstream uh, effect, or it accentuates that downstream effect. So 
that's a point that I left out or a point that I needed to emphasize during this stream. I have another comment here. Chaos Rain says, hey, doctor, what's going on, Chaos Rain? I'm wrapping this up. Everyone, enjoy the rest of your Friday. I will see you the next time. Uh, as always, remember that your attitude determines your altitude. Always try to do your best. Uh, take care, and I will talk to you the next time. Bye-bye.